John chapter 19. We're in the King Me series. Everybody say King Me. This series is designed to declare, reestablish, and to make known the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ still has power. And so that's what the King Me series is about, making sure that people understand that there's still power in that name. Amen? So I've asked some, uh, some of the leaders to, to get some chairs to put down front because I believe that the effective preaching of the gospel requires a response. And there are people that are watching today and those who are here in the church. And if you are moved as I'm preaching about Jesus that you want to get saved, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, or you want to join this church, we're putting seats down front because I'm playing no games. No orthodox altar call. If you feel it while I'm preaching, bring your stuff and come down to the front. Don't wait till the end. Don't assume we got till the end. You come down while the message is being preached. Amen? Amen. In John chapter 19, where I'm picking up the scripture, we find that Jesus has already been crucified by the Roman government at the request of Jewish leadership that incited the people to agree with them to get rid of this man who was causing so much trouble by doing miracles without permission. Rewind that the Jewish leadership incited the people to ask Pilate to crucify Jesus as a political usurper who was attempting a coup by declaring he was a king, and so you need to kill him. He's a threat to the Roman Empire, but more importantly, he's a threat to our position of influence in this culture because he's doing things without our permission. And I believe I'm supposed to tell some people here and those watching online that Jesus is about to begin to do things in your life without permission from the people who want to rule over you. He's about to deliver you without permission, elevate you without permission. He's about to give you resources without permission. And the people who thought they were the gatekeepers and doorkeepers in your life will have to stand by and watch as God heals you without permission, breaks chains without permission, and takes you to the place of authority that has your name on it without permission. Jesus has been crucified. It is not yet the Sabbath because this happened at Friday at 3 p.m. is about the time that Jesus died. But he had to get in the ground by sundown so that those who were Jews would not be ceremonially unclean because this was the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we did not want to touch dead things, we got to get Jesus in the ground. And so we pick up scripture after the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Everybody say fear. fear. Tell somebody you scared. Fear. Tell somebody you scared. Fear. So don't be a chicken. Fear. Tell somebody else, don't be a chicken. Fear. <laughs> for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night. Why did, G why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night, y'all? He was scared. Tell somebody, don't be scared. Tell somebody, stop being a chicken. He came at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Somebody say there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. What they were saying is, we don't have time to get him to another burial place. We got to get him in the ground before the sun goes down because this is the Passover, which is so interesting because they were literally holding the Passover lamb in their hands. 
20th chapter, first verse. Now the first day of the week, by the way, the first day of the week is not Monday, it's Sunday. Monday is when most people go to work, but the first day of the week is Sunday. Now we call the Sabbath the Lord's Day. The Sabbath is what, what we would normally call the sixth day or, or sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That would be the Sabbath in the Jewish tradition. But we worship on Sunday because Sunday is the Lord's day. It's the day he got up. And because we are not under the law, we're under grace. I need to give you some context. People say, well, why don't we worship on the Sabbath? Well, you should worship every day. And I don't need to wait till Saturday to worship. I don't need a special day to worship. I can worship on Tuesday at 1045 when I think about how good he's been. I can hit you with a praise Thursday at 3 p.m. I can hit you with a Friday night praise. I don't need a special day. Is there anybody else like me that doesn't need a special day. I'll give God praise. Try me right now. I might do it right now. I might praise him right now. Matter of fact, since you're playing with it, give me about 20 seconds right now. Hit me. Anybody want to give Jesus 20 seconds of praise? Go for it. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. See, worship is like Pringles. Once you start, you can't stop because you start thinking about other things God did. You start thinking about where you were, what you've gone through, when you messed up, and he still loved you, still covered you, still forgave you, still healed you, still uses you. Is there anybody like me that can just think for a moment at all? All you got to do is think about it, and you can't help but praise him. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Somebody say early. Amen. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. We know the other disciple is John, whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. They're in a race. So they both ran together. And the other disciple, John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. The linen strips that had been used to bury Jesus. The thing they used, the Bible says they used the strips to bound him, to bind him. He was bound. He was in bondage in the tomb. The strips that had, that had held him hostage were lying scattered in the tomb. A violent struggle for freedom happened in the tomb trying to help somebody because some of you some people don't understand why you worship like you do why you shout like you do my runners the way you run people are like that doesn't I don't understand that if you if you understood the bondage that the enemy had been trying to keep me in then you'd understand the praise that I'm giving him I don't shout because I'm out of control I shout because this is how you shout when you're trying to get free this is how you praise when you're trying to break through. This is how you praise when the enemy thought he had you and you finally get your joy. Tell somebody, excuse me while I praise him. John stooped down. You got to humble yourself. You're never going to access Jesus with pride. You're not doing him a favor. Tell somebody, stoop down. Don't get too high on the hog. If you want to get to Jesus, you're going to have to bow down. Hey, I don't care how much money you got. It doesn't matter. You couldn't write a check to get into heaven. I don't care what your 401k looks like. It couldn't pay for your sin. You better stoop down. You better bow down because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord in heaven, on earth, and under the earth.
He saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. I can see something took place, but I don't want to go in. Then Simon Peter came following him. He went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in place by itself. Woo! Tell somebody by myself. See, when you get a revelation of Jesus, you don't need anybody to help you. I could be over here in the corner by myself, minding my business, and I'm sitting next to you and next to you, but I'm thinking about what God did for me, and I'll start praising him, and I know you're next to me, and you don't know why I'm shouting, but before you judge me, just come walk a mile in my shoes. I'm not shouting to impress you. I'm shouting to thank him. I can shout all by myself. It would be nice if you helped me, but if you don't help me, I'm still going to praise him. If you don't help me, I'm still going to shout. If you don't help me, I'll still lift my hand. Simon went into the tomb, handkerchief folded in a place by itself, eighth verse. Then the other disciple, John, who came to the tomb first, then he went in also, he saw and believed. That's deep. He went in, he looked, he didn't go in. Then Peter went in, then Peter said, John, you gotta come in here. So it took John a second look to believe. Oh boy. So for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. So we're in the King Me series. This is part four of the King Me series. You've got Joseph of Arimathea who was afraid to be a public disciple for fear of the Jews. He was a chicken. Say chicken. Then you got Nicodemus who would visit Jesus at night for fear of the Jews. Say chicken. Then you got Peter who denied Jesus in front of Jesus after confessing Jesus in front of Jesus first. He was the first one to get the revelation that Jesus was not just a nice guy or a prophet, but that he was the unique son of God, the propitiation, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets here to save us from our sin, the full payment for our sin, our sickness, our malady, and our ailment according to Isaiah 53. 3, 4, and 5. Peter got the revelation, and Peter was the one who denied him. And he didn't deny him once, Sophia. He denied him three times. And at the third time, the rooster crowed, and Jesus looked him dead in his eyes. It's one thing to deny Jesus. It's another to deny him where he can hear you. He was scared. Say so he was a chicken. So we got three chickens, Joseph, Nicodemus, and Peter. Chickens. But then Joseph got strips of linen. Nicodemus got the myrrh and the aloe. They're burying Jesus in strips of linen. And I want to preach a message for King Me Part 4, chicken strips. <laughs> oh, you know you like that. You know you like that. And you're going to order some chicken strips this afternoon. Greenville, y'all need to write a check to Relentless because y'all going to be selling chicken strips all day today. Everybody say chicken strips. This is a unique title, but I want you to hear the heart behind it. And I believe there's a revelation for you. Amen? We find Jesus dead, but he's not yet buried. His body has been given to Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph 
had been watching Jesus and had observed Jesus and was actually following Jesus, but not publicly because he was afraid of the Jews. He was afraid because he was a wealthy man, no doubt a businessman, and many of his clientele, a large portion, if not a majority, were Jewish individuals who would find his discipleship to Jesus as offensive because Jesus was not functioning as the Mashiach that they expected because the Jewish leaders of the day wanted a Messiah who would overthrow the Roman government and give them power on earth. But Jesus made it very clear that my kingdom is not of this world, and so I'm not here to overthrow governments. I'm here to overthrow devils. Tell somebody this is spiritual. Not enough people understand that this is a spiritual war. And you are fighting people when people are not your problem. Stop attacking people and attack that devil. There's a spirit at work behind that person, behind that issue. Your spouse is not your enemy. The enemy is your enemy. So stop yelling at each other and start yelling at that devil to get out of your house. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Joseph had a tomb, and they didn't have enough time to get Jesus his own. And so Joseph said, give me the body. We'll put him in my tomb. But I got to get his body ready before sundown because I still want to observe the Passover. And so they begin to embalm the body. They had 100 pounds of myrrh and aloe and spices. Everybody say 100 pounds. That was 10 times the normal amount for a proper Jewish burial. If you study Jewish history, you'll understand that the more myrrh and aloe and spices you use to embalm an individual is a symbol of the value that person has in your life. Normally, a person dies, they use 10 pounds of spices, but they used 100 pounds because they valued Jesus. How much is Jesus worth to you? See, because the truth is, the name of the title is Chicken Strips, but the problem is we have too many chickens running around here who say they're Christians, but nobody knows it. Because you're only a Christian in here. You don't mind being an eagle in here, but you're a chicken at your job. You'll be an eagle. You'll fly all through here, shout, speak in every tongue, but let somebody ask you about a scripture out there. Well, you know, I let people do what they want. I'm just going to keep it to myself. But you'll rock a jersey for a team and represent your team, and that team doesn't even know you, but you buy their jersey. It's people ain't never been to Dallas who are Cowboys fans. All right. I am tired of being afraid to say the name Jesus. I'm sick of scared Christians. I'm sick of being a scared Christian. I'm tired of society attempting to mute my voice. We're in an age where they scream words like equality and understanding, but that's really not what they mean. What they mean is shut up about Jesus so we can live how we want. That's what they really mean. Just tell the truth. You don't like what we stand for, so you want to shut my mouth. And why are you so mad that I love Jesus? I didn't ask you to believe in Jesus. I told you I believe in Jesus. So why are you so offended that I believe in a virgin birth? I believe in a man named Jesus. I believe in the blood. I believe in the cross. I believe in the resurrection. I believe he's coming back again. Why do you want to shut me up so bad? Why do you? I am not going to be quiet about Jesus. I'm tired of being muted because of my faith. You can say anything. You can talk about any other faith, any other lifestyle, and everybody celebrates it. That's so brave. That's so wonderful. But when you tell people, I believe in Jesus, and he saved me from my sins, and he healed me, and by his stripes I'm healed, uh, that is an inclusive. What do you mean it's not inclusive? For God so loved the... There is nobody more inclusive than Jesus.
I wish I had a little bit of help in here. We've got too many chickens running around. And I'm not just talking about people who attend church on Sunday, because there's a lot of people who are still trying to figure it out. I'm talking about preachers. Some of my brothers and sisters, and I ain't naming no names because ain't, ain't no reason to do that, but I've seen people that are watered down the word to be popular with the world. You don't want to talk about sin anymore because you're worried about tithes walking out the door. Let me tell you something. If it wasn't, if Jesus didn't die for sin, then we don't even need to be in here because everybody that I know messed up in their life and you needed a Savior. If you don't need a Savior, there's the door. But if you're like me and you needed the blood, then you're in the right place because there's blood for you, there's grace for you, there's healing for you, there's mercy for you. When you repent, and turn. Tell somebody don't be a chicken. I'm tired of people telling me to be quiet. You ain't gonna shut me up. He saved me. And I ain't gonna be you ain't quiet about how you living. You loud, you bold, you you represent, you proud. Me too. I'm proud too. I'm proud of what Jesus did. I'm a complete mess without the blood. I'm, I'm toe up from the flow up without Jesus. So Joseph was a wealthy man. He was afraid of the Jews because he knew that if they found that he was a disciple, his, his income would dry up. Some people are chickens because of the mess with their money. Then you got Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He followed Jesus, but he still liked his status. Some people are chickens because they don't want to mess up their status. So is it your money or your status? And then there's some people like Peter who just afraid for their life. He was scared because he was like, if they're going to kill him, they might kill me too. So he denied him. So some people are chickens because of their money. Some people are chickens because of status. Some people are chicken because they're afraid for their lives. But Jesus said, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So we got three chickens and some strips of linen. And we got a body of a savior. And we got some spices. And we got a garden tomb. Somebody say garden. garden. See, this is what you, you've got to catch the transaction we lost our dominion in Eden when sin entered the picture by listening to a voice other than God. Eve ate the fruit, gave it to her husband Adam who was standing there. God cursed the serpent. He did not curse Adam and Eve. He cursed the serpent. But then he said to Eve, you'll birth, but there'll be pain in your birthing. Before it was easy. But now that sin is in a depiction, you're going to struggle to produce a legacy. And Adam, I called you to work the garden, not worship what was in it. You got so caught up in Eve that you listened to her over me. So since you made her a God in your life, I'm going to show you, I'm going to still let you produce from the ground, but the ground is going to have thorns and thistles, and there, it will be a struggle to produce a harvest. I need you to catch this, because I've always wondered, he was working in a garden, y'all. Now, if there are any farmers here, you know you sow in the spring and you reap in the fall. Now, if you wait in six months, you got enough time to rest and, and get refreshed. Unless, of course, in the Garden of Eden, when you plant it, it grows right away. So something hit me because Jesus was always talking about three days. If, if, if I'm buried on the third day, I'm getting up. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, and then he spit him out. That'll be the sign to this wicked generation, the sign of Jonah. Three days, tear this temple down. In three days, I'll raise it up. I wonder if the original harvest was if you planted on one day, by day three, that thing was producing. It would make sense because in the garden, we had full access and no impediments. 
There's something about the garden. We lost dominion in the garden. Then in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus wrestled with his human self and his divine call. And he said, I'd rather not do this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so we lost dominion in the garden. Jesus made a decision to die in the garden. Then he died and was buried in a garden. But you don't bury things in a garden. You plant them. I, I don't have nobody that heard what I said. I wish the balcony would catch what I said. Jesus wasn't buried. He was planted. And it took three days for what was planted on Friday to produce an eternal harvest by Sunday. I'm here to announce that God is getting ready <laughs> to produce a harvest on stuff that you've sown in years past. I am prophetically declaring for people here and watching online that in three days, for some of you in three days, you're going to see a harvest on what you sow. I wish I Get something in your hands and put it on the altar for me, Pastor Aventer. I said in three days, some of us are going to see a harvest for things that we have sown or believed for. I believe it with all of my heart. We lost dominion in the garden, Becca. Jesus wrestled in the garden to make a decision to follow the Father. Then when he died, he was buried in a garden. Excuse me, he wasn't buried. He was planted because he said, unless the seed dies, Pastor DeMarcus, he said, unless it dies, it can't produce. Oh my gosh. You have been saying, God, I'm in bondage. I'm struggling. He said, no, you're planted. God is dark. I'm in a tomb. No, you're in the ground. I had to sow you in order to reproduce you. I, <laughs> the harvest is coming. And I'm not just talking financial. I'm talking spiritual authority. I'm talking wisdom to live a holy life. I'm talking the ability, sir, to reestablish your authority in your house. The reason why there's drama in your house is because your wife and you have switched places and you got so tired of fighting that you let her run the thing. But God said he called their name Adam. She's supposed to be called by your name. You can't abdicate the throne of responsibility just because you're tired. God still calls you to be the head of the house. You're the one that sets the spiritual temperature in the house. God still wants to hear from you. Yes, it's good that your wife prays, but God wants to hear that man pray. I went upstairs last night. I bound up every devil in hell. I prayed over my kids' rooms. I said, you got to get out of here. You can't have no place in my house. This whole thing belongs to me. God is looking for somebody that will take a thought. Jesus was bound in strips of linen. We know that linen was a part of the ephod, the priestly garment. Oh, stay with me. I'm almost done. Can I preach it like I? Jesus was dead, but Joseph valued him. He valued him because he thought he had lost him. Don't value Jesus after you think you can't get it back. My prayer is that you'd begin to sow into your relationship in the good times. Be public about your love for Jesus. You notice people in the world don't care what you think about them? You notice people that, that don't go to church, they don't mind talking about, they don't care what you think? So why do you care? Why are you so quiet about your Jesus? 
when they so loud about how they want to live? When did, when did we get that scared? We can't talk about Jesus? No, I'm going to talk about him. You know, you can't do prayer in public schools. Yes, I can. You can't stop me from praying. I pray whenever I want. I dare you to try me. I ain't got to stop class to pray. I can pray while I'm doing my math. I can pray while I'm at lunch. I can pray while I'm walking down the hallway. Got oil on my fingers, just touching lockers. You can't stop me from praying. I don't need to make a big fuss about it, but you can't I'm anointed whether you hear me or not. He was planted. And many of you here and watching online don't realize that you are not dead, you're not buried, you are planted. But God's about to get you up. But here's the thing. Jesus got up early Sunday morning while it was still dark. See, the reason why so many of us struggle is because people see us in the day but don't know God's been working on us at night. See, people are visual creatures, Manira, and they only want to see, they want to see everything. But in this season, God is not showing folk everything. He's teaching you some things in the dark. He's teaching you some things by yourself. He's, he's growing you, maturing you. He is stripping you in the dark so that when the lights come on, people are going to be like, you look familiar, but there's something different. Is there anybody that wants that kind of power? That you've gone through a process that people can't see, but you walk in a power that the people can't deny. So you got three chickens running around. They got some tomb, they got a tomb, they got some spices, and they got some strips. They wrapped him in spices. They got some chicken wrapped in spices. You need to have spices. And the Bible says that Jesus was in the lower parts of the earth. Sheol, death, hell, and the grave. So they put him in the tomb, sealed the tomb, but then he went to the lower parts of the earth. So it's almost like he was in an oven. See, when you, when you season food right, you can smell it while it's cooking. See, the reason why people are starting to be drawn to you is because the seasoning of your life is beginning to draw people to you. I've walked into a house and said, what is that smell? Grandma cooking, I can smell the garlic. There's a little pepper in there. See, the reason why you're struggling is because God's been seasoning you. And when he seasoned you, he put some stuff in your eyes that kind of blinded you. And he blinded you because you got to walk by faith and not by sight. Then you're up... Some of you have been struggling because there's been great pain as God has been developing you. And it's like, God, why do you keep hitting me? He said, I'm not hitting you, I'm tenderizing you. I've got to tenderize you so when I'm done with you, when people dine on you, they'll be able to receive you easy because people are so hurt they don't have time to chew. They just got to be able to drink it in. The best meat is not the meat you got to chew hard. It's the meat that falls off the bone. God says, I want you to fall off the bone. I want you to be accessible. I want you to be humble. I want you to be loving. So I have to tenderize you so you don't walk around in pride. So I had to tenderize you. I had to keep you in that oven until you were ready. And I know it hurt. But I'm about to present you to the world. Jesus was wrapped in strips of linen. Three days, y'all. Everybody say three days. I feel led in my spirit to tell you something significant is going to happen in three days. I believe by Wednesday, somebody in this room or watching online will be the recipient of the most stunning news that you could imagine. God's about to open up a door that is so spacious that you will be able to bring your whole family in. I believe that something so significant is scheduled to happen in your life that you had to get to this church 
this morning. I believe that God will send a word, and if you receive the word, God will release something over your life. Somebody say three days. Do I believe every human being that hears this will happen in three days? No. Some people won't receive it. Others won't believe it. But I believe there are enough people in here that something significant is supposed to happen. And most people think that that's money. But elder, some stuff is better than money. Like freedom. Peace. Deliverance. Joy in your marriage, healing for your children, a legacy for the future. There are some things that are better than money. Somebody shout with her. Somebody shout with her. Some things are better than money. a few more minutes. I got to get this sweat off my head because some things are better than money. Did you hear what I said? Pastor DeMarcus, that's your mama. Today is her birthday. You're sitting here, mama, and your son is a part of a move of God. And I know you had another son. And he's in heaven, but I need you to know that that's your legacy right there. The Hill name is going to continue raised in the fear of the Lord. Now he and his household walking in authority. Some things are better than money. The best birthday gift is to see that your legacy is secure. The best birthday gift you can receive is that your son is serving God and that his son is serving God and his daughter is serving God. I want you to know that there are some things that are better than money. The church has reduced the blessing of God to money, but money is not a blessing in and of itself. If you don't have the wisdom for what he's bringing, it could become a curse. Give me wisdom like Solomon, so when you give me the resource, I know what to do and who to give it to. God, teach me how to invest. Give me good credit. Help me to have a savings plan. And then, God, let me work out so I can live long enough to see that thing come to pass in my grandchildren's lives. For a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Some things are better than money. Let me hurry up, Pastor Trevor. I got to give him these points because they ran to the tomb. Everybody wants to run to Easter and then run right past him. They visit on Easter and then on Christmas because there's a difference between Jesus and Jesus Christ. See, if you're just interested in Jesus, you'll come occasionally. But when you meet Jesus Christ, you will beat the doors down to get... Is there anybody that knows there's a difference between Jesus and Jesus Christ? See, because Jesus is a historical figure, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. One is historical, the other is supernatural. Woo! See, Jesus by himself is just a nice man, a nice prophet who hugged children and touched lepers. But Jesus Christ could talk to dead things and they would get up. He would tell devils where to go and when to go and they would do it because he said it because he had more authority than them. Ah, help me, Holy Ghost. There's no greater horror movie to the devil than the name of Jesus Christ. When you say the name of Jesus Christ, devils have to bow. Jesus by himself is okay, but Jesus Christ Every knee has to bow. Jesus you can passively observe, but Jesus Christ you must encounter. Jesus by himself you can watch, but Jesus Christ you must worship. Jesus you can talk about, but Jesus Christ you must submit to. Because a real encounter with Jesus will strip you. Every strip that Jesus was bound in is what was binding us. All right, I'm going to come over here. 
Jesus was never in bondage. We were. So when they were putting the strips on him, that was our bondage strips by his stripes. Somebody's getting ready to shout in the back. One of y'all's going to run. Don't mind them. Because the strips are stripes. And the stripes are your bondage. And if he was bound with what had you in bondage, but he broke free, he didn't break free for himself. He broke free for you. So why are you sitting down like you're not free? Why are you sitting there like you still got chains? You better, you better check again. You better move a leg. You better jump up and down. You better act like you know you. I dare you to check again. I hear the Lord say, check again. Check again. The bondage is gone. Check again. The deliverance is here. Check again. Freedom is here. Check again. Mary Magdalene ran to the tomb. She looked in, saw the stone was rolled away. She said, his body is gone. John the Baptist didn't go in. He just looked in, saw the strips of linen. Then Peter went all the way in, saw the linen that John saw, but because he went in, he also saw the handkerchief that was on Jesus' face folded in a different place. What's the significance, Pastor John? Well, each one of them went into the same place but saw something different. See, that's why you can't be judging my worship because I'm not here for the same reason you are. You might come in for one thing, but I came in for something else. You might see one thing, but I see something else. You might just see the body gone, but I see the linen strips that he died. I see the thing that he died for. I see what he freed me from. So my praise is different. My worship is different. Mary Magdalene saw the body because she was so connected to the man, she needed to cling to him. That's why when she saw him, she clung to him. He said, don't cling to me, for I've not yet gone to the Father. Don't, don't hug me, Mary. I got to present myself to the Father for inspection. I am the lamb that was slain. Watch this. John saw the strips of linen. The strips of lim linen were on the body. He saw them scattered about. John's revelation is that the body is scattered. He came out. Peter went all the way in. Now, this is important. Peter saw the strips of linen, symbolic of the body, but he also saw the handkerchief, symbolic of the head, and it was in a different place than the strips of linen. And why would, why would the Holy Spirit allow Peter to see something John didn't? Because Peter denied Christ. So he was disconnected from the head. So the Holy Spirit needs to show him, you're still a part of the body, but you disconnected from the head. And why were the strips scattered, but the handkerchief folded? Because there was order in the head, but chaos in the body. And when in Jewish tradition you fold a handkerchief and put it down, it is symbolic that you were so impressed with the service, when you folded a napkin, it means I'm coming back again. He tore the strips off because he was fighting for you and me. But he also folded the napkin to say I'm coming back. I'm coming back again. Let me fold this napkin because I'm coming back again. I don't know who this is for, but he's not done yet. He's coming back again. He's coming to see you, coming to heal you, coming to deliver you, coming to break through. He's coming back again. And if you believe it, give the Lord Jesus a great praise. Okay. 
trying to let y'all go. He's coming back again. They were chickens, but because they ran to the tomb, everything that had them in bondage had been stripped away. Chickens that had been stripped of their fear, stripped of their insecurities, stripped of their shame. And you went from a chicken to an eagle because they will mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. I dare you to soak. I dare you to soar. I dare you to soar. Keep soaring. You're not a chicken. I'm talking to somebody. Stop running scared. You know why they call them chickens and chickens are connected to fear? Because chickens run when somebody's chasing them. You know why? Because the way that you kill a chicken is to cut its head off. In the country, my, my, my father-in-law told me they would swing the chicken and boom. Snap his neck. That's how they did it. I was like, Jesus, is that what that poor bird had to do to be on my plate? I feel sorry for it. Why you stop soaring? It's funny, y'all got nervous. I can't soar. you talking about chicken. I'm... <laughs> Notice, chickens don't fly. They got wings, but they don't know how to use them. I bind the spirit of chickens in here. You about to soar. You're going to fly. You're going to be everything that God created you to be. You're going to walk in authority. You're going to walk in victory. You're going to walk in power in the name of Jesus. There are people in this room, God has spoken to you. You need to soar all the way down here. You, your Bible, your family, you need to get down here. Don't be trying to sneak out and leave. I need elders in place. I don't know what you're waiting on. You got 15 seconds. You know this is your church. You know you need to get saved. You know you need to rededicate. I need you down at this altar, and I need you to run down here like I was preaching to you. Hurry up. Hurry, 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 hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry.